Netflix has graced us with an adaptation of Eric Maria Remarque's novel, bringing the horrors of war to a living room near you. And boy, is it a wild ride that'll make you see the world a little less bright. Ugh. Well, once you're all done watching bright-eyed young men turn into a fine red mist, let's see what you might have missed and all quiet on the Western Front. I'm Joey C. Let's go. This movie is actually the third adaptation of Remark's novel. Lewis Milestone directed the first adaptation in 1930, just barely two years after the novel was written. It even won the Academy Award for Outstanding Production and Best Director, while also being nominated for Best Writing and Best Cinematography. A television film was produced in 1979, written by Paul Monash, and directed by Delbert Mann. This actually won awards too. The Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture Made for Television as well as an Emmy Award for Outstanding Film Editing for a Limited Series or a Special. Edward Berger's 2022 Netflix adaptation is actually the most expensive German film in the history of Netflix, with a budget of $1.2 million. I guess that explains why subscription fees keep going up. We don't know if this version will win any awards, but if it doesn't at least get a nod for its cinematography or action set pieces, it's practically a war crime. The title of the film, All Quiet on the Western Front, refers to the ending of the novel that the movie is based on, in which the reader is told by the narrator that there was nothing new to report on the Western Front. However, if you examine the direct translation of the original German title, it means, in the West, nothing's new. The English title can be taken as reference to the end of the story, coinciding with the ceasefire on Armistice Day, while the German title can be interpreted to have much darker undertones regarding the never-ending cycle of violence and bloodshed. And if you've seen this movie, you could definitely tell what Edward Berger and his friends had in mind. The beginning of the film introduces us to our main character, Paul, and his best friends, Franz, Krop, and Ludwig. As they're signing up to join the army, they receive an inspiring speech from their fanatical nationalist teacher. He preaches about how they're the best generation and how they'll make their parents proud by going to war. And as their faces glow up with glee, mind droops with depression. After their physical, they receive their uniforms and march off singing confidently with the rest of the soldiers. The camera's kind enough to show them off, in the order that they die in the film too, starting with Ludwig, Krop, Franz, who admittedly dies off screen, and finally Paul. Poor Ludwig, at least he could barely see his death coming. I can't imagine that glasses made in 1917 strapped on with string are particularly beneficial. A real handy reoccurring element of the movie is the leitmotif employed by Volker Bertelmann. Volker employs a Hans Zimmer-esque BRAM throughout the film to punctuate serious moments in a way that often take the audience off guard. But one of the best implementations is its first. It happens right when our happy group of friends are off to war. And if you look at the historical context out of the story, you'd almost think it was their theme song. Almost as if this was some Goonies knockoff set in World War I. Actually, come to think about it, this sounds like a Stranger Things spin-off in the making. Netflix, feel free to steal that idea. Two scenes in the movie involve a young soldier collecting the dog tags of fallen comrades. Following an intense battle, the dog tags are oval-shaped and breakable in the middle, allowing for ease of separation without having to get into all the gooey or charred bits. This is a slight historical inaccuracy as the dog tags that were used on the German side varied depending on the division. The breakable ones were only used by specific groups, but hey, anything to make the lives of the soldiers a bit more bearable has to count for something, right? Those guys needed all the help they can get. The trench scenes in the movie are simply spectacular, just claustrophobic and gritty enough without sacrificing visual clarity on the audience's behalf. The only way this movie could feel more visceral is if you were actually in the trenches almost being crushed to death by a tank. Although, if you actually have narrowly avoided death by tank, you'll notice that the St. Chamon tanks used in the movie have the wrong road wheels, clearly belonging to more modern World War II era tanks. Drivers of the tanks actually hated using these things in trench warfare, as the heavy nose would cause them to dip into the trenches rather than coast over top. Also, if you have narrowly avoided death by tank, please let us know what that was like in the comments below. I'm dying to know. Remember how the camera showing off our main group of friends foreshadowed how Ludwig would die first and how Paul would die last? Well, when Paul has to collect Ludwig's dog tags, we see the right half of his face is clean. 
or as clean as it could be, while the left half of his face is covered in blood. Clearly, it's symbolic how war tainted a pure soul who had so much to live for, and this symbolism works its way back towards the end of the movie. In the penultimate battle, Paul's face gets caked in mud, covering his right half. While the placement isn't one-to-one, -one, it's still a striking visual element that indicates how far the war has pushed him, only made worse when he tries and fails to save an enemy that he murdered in cold blood. It's worth noting that the book the movie is based on is a work of historical fiction. While the author was a veteran of World War I, and the accounts of the battlefield are first-hand, Paul's story isn't connected to any one human being. In fact, the regiment he joins, the 78th Reserve Division, fought on the Eastern Front, not the Western Front. It just goes to show how effective storytelling can overcome any minor historical inaccuracies. It makes you wonder why he featured the 78th Division in his work, because he himself served in the second guards reserve perhaps it's to make it feel like war is totally disconnected from reality which it is the movie concludes on armistice day an official ceasefire that occurred at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of that year that's when every soldier could go home to their families physically emotionally and psychologically scarred for the rest of their lives unfortunately Paul didn't, as his division was ordered to make one final desperate push before the armistice went into full effect. Apparently, 11,000 people lost their lives that day, right before the ceasefire was enforced. Allegedly, many of those deaths were recorded as having occurred on November 10th to hide the embarrassment from the soldiers' families. As Paul is being drafted, he receives his uniform. Initially bright-eyed, he attempts to return it as it has someone else's name tag, but it's returned to him with the false excuse stating it must have been, quote, too small for the other soldier. If you look closely, you'll see the name tag reads Heinrich, who is our POV character from the opening shots of the movie, heading into the trenches armed with nothing but his trusty spade. The purpose of recycling uniforms in this manner wasn't uncommon, to the point where German uniforms were often repurposed allied uniforms. That's because wool is scarce and human life isn't. I'd like to say that it's surprising Paul didn't take this as a red flag, but as we've discussed before, kids will believe anything. But hey, at least it doesn't chafe. Despite being a depressingly bleak tale about the tragedies of wartime, All Quiet on the Western Front manages to inject some levity where it's needed. We get a delightful scene where Paul and his wartime buddy Cat steal a goose from the local farm as they're desperate for a substantial hot meal. While it's great watching our guys be dudes while surviving by the skin of their teeth, the tragic reality of this scene is that it happened more often than you might think. Widespread food shortages affected all the soldiers who were engaged in trench warfare. Apart from the natural damage the unnatural trenches had on the local soil and crops, the second half of the war saw the British impose a blockade on imports and exports to and from Germany, resulting in a crippling food shortage. The French even took matters into their own hands to resist occupation occupation, both on and off the battlefield. Citizens would even take things a step further, sabotaging railroad tracks to disrupt Germany's supply lines. One of the most tragic scenes in the film is when Paul and Kat return to the farm they had stolen eggs from earlier for one final egg heist. It goes about as well as you'd expect, fleeing for their lives with yolk dripping down their trousers. They save what's left of it in a can, and while Paul suggests they fry it up, Cat just sucks it down like it's water. Do not do this. Unpasteurized egg yolk contains an immense risk of bearing foodborne illnesses, man. Although, considering Cat gets shot by the farmer's son after the scene, I guess that's gotta be better than lead poisoning. Actually, considering the alternative was to die from hypothermia and malnutrition, you could say that these guys were caught between a yolk and a hard place. As with any war drama, the costume department has to be commended. While the uniforms in the movie are pretty spot on, you can see some mistakes slip right through the cracks. When Paul and his friends first hop into the trenches, you can see that Kat's holding a camouflage helmet. This is one of the few historic inaccuracies of the film, as camouflage helmets weren't implemented until the following summer of 1918. And honestly, I can't see it being of much use in this particular theater of war. In most of the battlefields present in the movie, it would ironically stick out like a sore thumb. As with any adaptation of book to film, some things have to be cut for time. It's the nature of the beast. One such here is an entire chapter following Paul on an eight-day home leave, reconnecting with his family but ultimately realizing he's estranged from his old way of life. While an unfortunate cut, one of the characters does recite a key line from the book that gets the point across. The war has ruined everything for us. 
While it would have been a very impactful scene, the movie's already two and a half hours long. Besides, you can even tell by the look on Paul's face that life would never be the same for him, even if he made it home. Another change made from book to film is in Paul's characterization. In the scene where he stabs a French soldier, rifles through his personal papers, and sees that he has a family waiting for him, Paul promises to contact the dying man's family after the war, holding the papers and emotions they bear. This is a major departure from the novel, where after making his promise, he immediately pivots back to cold, emotionless soldier boy. It's a pretty significant change that takes away from the book's message of how war ultimately dehumanizes us, but for the sake of the film, you could argue it adds an additional layer of tragedy to Paul's arc. Adding to the list of changes from the source material, the movie actually has Paul and his friends join the army two years later than in the book. Some might consider it a bit of a stretch that so many young lads would be persuaded to join the army at this point in the war. By 1917, the Battle of the Somme had been fought, with millions of soldiers coming home either crippled or in body bags. While it seems a little unlikely that the kids would join the war at this point, that also might be the film's point. Despite how dire and awful the realities of war may be, you're still not immune to propaganda. The movie concludes with Paul and his battalion being sent in a half an hour before the armistice goes into effect in a last ditch effort to conquer one bit of French land so they can go home as heroes instead of cowards. This didn't happen in the novel or even in the first real world war. In the book, Paul dies a month before the armistice due to unspecified causes. This appears to be a change on the director's behalf to indicate that the war ending the way it did embittered many generals towards social democrats and Jews. Had it not been for their cowardice, they would have won the war. It's a sensible change considering the author of the book wrote it in 1928, five years before Adolf Hitler's rise to power. Whether or not that's a good change is up to the viewer though. Clocks end up playing an important thematic role in the third act. Driven, not by plot, but rather through immersing the audience in experiences of the German soldier from 1917 onward. It's hard to tell how much time has passed for most of it, and that's the point. The movie illustrates the sense of temporal distortion soldiers feel when experiencing the extreme danger intermixed with extreme tedium. When we reach the film's end, Paul's commanding officer insists on drawing out the war until 11 a.m. for the sake of patriotic pride. And while Paul is fighting his last fight in the trenches, we cut back to General Friedrich's grandfather clock, emphasizing how the soldiers are pointlessly living on borrowed time. The movie is sure to illustrate the plight of soldiers on and off the battlefield. When Paul reunites with his comrade, Stackfleet, he's been shot in the leg. As Paul brings him some soup, he stabs himself in the neck with a fork. Which is why you don't let your friends eat soup with a fork, people. Initially, one might question why someone would give up on surviving such a brutal war so close to its end. But unfortunately, it's a realistic outcome. Going home from war maimed as he was, was seen as another form of death by many. As edgy as it may sound, part of you really does die on the battlefield. So if you come home from war, do you really come home at all? The novel largely focuses on the perspective of the German soldiers during the war, which makes sense. After all, this was written by a German soldier, and that informs the story. But the role of the adaptation is also to elaborate and expand upon the work being adapted. As such, the film is the freedom of showing the perspective of a French soldier on the front lines, showing that they're basically stuck in the same position as the Germans. We even get to see them enjoying wine before the Germans raid their pantries, which is quite the war crime. While the movie could have wrapped with the clock striking 11 and Paul heading home, instead we see him defending one of the new recruits during Friedrich's last attack. With this scene, we have a wild depiction of the cycle of war, with Paul having repeated the actions of the soldier whose uniform he inherited at the start of the movie, as well as the soldier who helped him first when he arrived at the front. Paul's character development has reached his peak with him fully embodying the hardened veteran that's increasingly less likely to escape the war. While Paul may have been tainted by battle, he can make sure the next generation won't be, sacrificing himself to save the child. What does the child do before heading home? collecting the dog tags of his fallen comrades, including the man who saved him. Regardless of what liberties were taken, it's safe to say that Edward Berger and crew managed to communicate the message of the novel. And that's what's most important in a situation where the movie is based on a book. Some parts were excluded, some were made up completely, but overall, we think the point was nailed, man. Boy, that movie was really something. It really makes you see the world a little less bright. What did you think of All Quiet on the Western Front? 
Was it too long? Was it too violent? Did we notice anything that you didn't? If so, let us know in the comments below. And as always, everybody, thanks for watching.